Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone. Uh, good to see your faces. And uh, I just want to say a few words of welcome and thank everyone for being here, albeit in uh, somewhat unusual circumstances, although I guess we're all getting used to this. Uh, we've held many Fed Listens events over the past 16 months, <clears throat> and it's important to note that these conversations are not just a nice way to talk to people from around the country, although they are that. What they provide, what you provide, is insight that we just can't get anywhere else. You add depth and definition to the flood of data that flows through the Fed every day. You give us perspective on the economic realities that don't show up on a spreadsheet. You help us see those complex sets of data that analyze the American economy through the eyes of the people, businesses, and communities that make up the American economy. And that information is very helpful to us as we make our policy decisions. So this is a valuable exercise for us and an enjoyable one as well. So we truly do appreciate it on a number of levels. The Reserve Banks are also continuing to hold conversations in communities across the country to help capture economic realities on the ground. We are in the midst of an economic downturn without modern precedent. It was sudden and it is severe. It has already erased the job gains of the past decade and has inflicted acute pain across the country. And while the burden is widespread, it's not evenly spread. Those taking the brunt of this fallout are those least able to bear it. The pain of this downturn is compounded by the upending of normal life, along with great uncertainty about the future. In the best of times, predicting the path of the economy with any certainty is difficult. In fact, John Kenneth Galbraith famously said that economic forecasting exists, exists to make astrology look respectable. We are now experiencing a whole new level of uncertainty, as questions only the virus can answer complicate the outlook. Policies that address the resumption of economic activity are the province of elected officials at all levels of government in close consultation with public health and medical professionals. But all of us have our own decisions to make as well, and those decisions will depend on public confidence that it's again safe to undertake various activities. From an economic perspective, we hope to learn a lot from your experiences and from what you're hearing from your colleagues, customers, and communities. How they're coping with that uncertainty now, how they're thinking about a future that's harder to plan for, and what matters most as they navigate the path. The feedback we get from our community and business contacts, contacts has always been crucial in how we conduct monetary policy. In extraordinary times such as these, it takes it on even greater importance. So I want to thank you again for providing that insight, and I very much look forward to our conversation. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Governor Brainerd. Lael, over to you. Lael, over to you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. So this is the 15th uh, Fed Listens event uh, over 16 months. We have listened to diverse voices from every type of community, every sector, and every district of our country. This rich set of perspectives is helping bring alive for us the importance of the review of our monetary policy strategy tools and communication practices led by Vice Chair Rich Clarida. We've heard that maximum employment brings vital benefits, takes a very long time to arrive in many neighborhoods, and is not captured in a single national statistic. We've heard that inflation matters. Households at different life stages and in different places are balancing the cost of living against their earnings while businesses are balancing wages and other costs against their pricing power. We have heard that access to credit matters and that it's important to use a full range of tools to support the economy. When we embarked on this listening journey, little did we know that our nation would experience the heartache associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, an emergency unprecedented in modern times. Last year, we heard from small businesses that were expanding their workforces and investing in their communities. Today, many of those same businesses are running low on cash reserves and struggling to make rent and payroll, especially those in consumer services such as restaurants and retail. Last year, national unemployment had fallen to its lowest point in over five decades. Today, it surged to levels not seen since the Great Depression. Last year, historically challenged groups were gaining a foothold in the workforce, and employers were investing in training and loosening job eligibility requirements. Today, the fallout from COVID has cruelly hit groups with the, the uh, thinnest financial cushions hardest. 
workers in the lowest quarter of earnings, people of color, low and moderate income communities, and women disproportionately employed in services jobs. So as we think about how the Federal Reserve's tools and presence in communities around the country could best provide stability at this trying time and strong support for the recovery to come, we wanted to turn again to many of the same voices we heard from earlier to learn how the COVID pandemic has affected your communities and what lies ahead. So with that, I wanna to turn to the panelists. I'm going to ask each of you a question that references what we've heard from you in our interactions before the COVID pandemic to explore what has changed. I would invite my colleagues to jump in with their questions as we go. So we're gonna start with Amanda Cage. Amanda Cage is president and CEO of the National Fund for Workforce Solutions a role she assumed in March 2020 after eight years at the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. The National Fund invests in a national network of 33 communities taking a demand-driven, evidence-based approach to workforce development. Leveraging its local partners, the National Fund shares learning across the network. Amanda, here's a quote from you last October. What we're seeing is huge disparities in what unemployment looks like for neighborhoods. 17.2% in Englewood, 15.7% in Fuller Park, 15.1% in West Englewood. That's the best that they have ever been, and these are the same rates that we considered catastrophic for the national picture at the height of the recession. That was at a time when average unemployment across the country was below 4%. Today, it's 20% overall. How have things changed for residents of neighborhoods in Chicago, such as Englewood and Fuller Park, over the past few months? Amanda, over to you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. So how have things changed for these residents? First of all, they've been hit hardest by the coronavirus. In Chicago, coronavirus Virus cases are concentrated in Black and Latinx communities. Black residents represent 32% of the infections and half of the deaths. Latinx residents, 45% of the infections, and those numbers are rising. The jobs that sustained these neighborhoods disappeared overnight. If you work for a hotel or a restaurant, you were a child care, home care worker, a security guard, an administrative assistant, your services were no longer needed during shelter in place. And if you were an entrepreneur and had your own small business, it shut down. And if your jobs didn't disappear, they blew up. If you're a truck driver or a warehouse worker or worked at a grocery store, you were working more now than ever and being asked to do more, to work more hours under riskier conditions. So these workers are really facing a difficult equation, risking their physical health or making ends meet. And this isn't a hypothetical question for these folks. If you live in a black neighborhood in Chicago, you know of somebody who has died from coronavirus. You know scores of people who have been infected. And this question is weighing very heavily on the families in these neighborhoods. When I spoke last October, we were experiencing the longest economic expansion and the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. And the problem that we were focused on was shared prosperity. How could we use this tight labor market to chip away at persistent racial inequities? How could we bring people back into the labor market who have been excluded? We were working with employers who were desperate to recruit and train and uh, retain workers, and we were helping them figure out how to improve the quality of their jobs so they could be more attractive. On March 1st, I walked into a new position as the CEO of the National Fund for Workforce Solutions to work on these issues on a national scale. Two weeks into my tenure, the world turned upside down. Now I work with communities across the country who are just trying to respond to the crisis. The National Fund has collaborated through United Ways, the Community Foundation, Workforce Boards, and Chambers of Commerce, and we're trying to address the immediate needs. We're helping millions of people as they stand in a virtual line for unemployment, we're trying to figure out how to provide education and training services to people who don't have access to computers or internet connections. And we're trying to rapidly deploy laid off workers because there are companies who are still hiring. I just want to close by talking about this 20% unemployment figure. Um, I keep hearing the same refrain, 
not since the Depression era, or not since the 1930s, but we have a modern day image of what 20% unemployment looks like. It looks like Englewood on the south side of Chicago. It looks like our most, um, our, our communities that are experiencing the most um, distress in our urban neighborhoods and our rural towns. Um, and I think that uh, as a country, we don't have a sense of what 20% unemployment looks like for the rest of us, even if it is short lived. Thank you, Amanda. I'm going to pause for just a second and see if any of my colleagues want to jump in and ask a question. Otherwise, I'll go to the next panelist and give them another opportunity afterwards. All right. Why don't we go to the next panelist and invite you to come in whenever, whenever you choose. So next, uh, I want to turn to Pat Yakovich who uh, we commonly refer to as Duke, who is a former firefighter and the president of the Greater Kansas City AFL-CIO, which advocates for workers at all levels of the economic spectrum, from the players for the Super Bowl champions, the Kansas City Chiefs, to the men and women who maintain and clean the stadium. So Duke, last June, you reported that one of the really great things about the good jobs market is that it was providing the most vulnerable people in Kansas City with a foothold in the workforce. But you also talked about preparing for a downturn. Here's your quote. If the last people you hire are the people you've determined are not your first choice, they're gonna be the first ones gone. So let's make sure we've got something in place where we will offer them some ability to move to part-time or some opportunity to train for something else to stay in the workforce. But once you lose them, it's extremely difficult to get them back. Since that time, because of COVID, we've seen layoffs in some sectors skyrocket and rising concerns about health and safety in other industries. What worries you most about how workers and particularly vulnerable workers are doing? Well, thank you, Governor Brainerd. I really appreciate that. Um, so the biggest worry for me is that some of the most vulnerable will lose hope. Hope is another very important intangible that has an impact on the economy. I mean, I kind of look at it as kind of like uh, consumer confidence, but probably a lot harder to measure. Because the people without the education or skills to be considered for a job, or the people who made a mistake and possibly had a criminal record, they were knocked out of contention for employment. Those people were getting jobs. They had the ability to make the future brighter. And we saw a movement in the right direction for women and people of color. And now far too many of them are once again out of the workforce. And we all hope it's just for a little bit longer until everybody's back and everybody makes it out and survives and is on the other side of this. But that just might not be the case. And it's really scary. You know, the stimulus checks and the increases in unemployment have worked very well to keep families solvent. But it's going to end soon. And so here's the big question we're struggling with. What's gonna last longer, the money or the virus? Will we be back at work with paychecks when the unemployment payments end? And if not, how big is that gap gonna be? Because a lot of people don't have the resources to be able to cover that gap for very long. So many people are living paycheck to paycheck. There's a real fear. We'll see more homelessness when this is all over. You know, in 60 Minutes, Chairman Powell said that when people are out of a job for long periods of time, their skills atrophy and they lose contact with the workforce and that longer and deeper recessions do damage people's careers. And it's very true. And it's also true that employees with more experience tend to have more sustainable skills and a stronger connection to the workforce that won't fade as fast as newly employed people. Most of us don't even exactly know when it happened, or some don't even realize it happened. But at some point in almost everyone's life, your job becomes a part of your identity. We use it when we describe or introduce ourselves to others. And the career damage is going to be more severe and longer lasting to those that haven't formed that bond yet. Um, we all have safety nets. 
in life. We have families, friends, there's government programs, there's even charities to fall back on. But a lot of the people that we're talking about here have used up all of those resources previous to being employed. I'm also really concerned with what it's going to take to get back to the point where labor was in such high demand that wages were headed in the right direction. I mean, prior to the crisis, employers across the country and pretty much in every sector were saying the same thing. I can't find qualified workers. And then this hit, and again, it is across the country and in pretty much every sector where people are losing their jobs. And so how far do we have to get back to the point where we're seeing people who weren't the first choice getting employment? And what's it gonna look like for workers when they're on the other side of this? You know, we all understand that companies wanna restart and produce things. And please trust me, workers want to go back to work. Everyone does. We, uh, we all know that there are gonna be risks and they're gonna to have to be taken. But when we get America back open for business and fully open, there's just not gonna be a good way for people to work safely for so many people. Manufacturing and assembly lines, a lot of times takes two people in a very close proximity to be able to complete a task. There's just not really gonna be a good way to try to, to separate them. And the meat processing plants are basically assembly lines in reverse. People are working very closely and they have got no choice but to be there. Thank you. Thank you, Duke. All right, I'm gonna again uh, pause and just uh, see whether my colleagues uh, have a question for Duke or Amanda. Duke I'll, uh, or Amanda, I'll, uh, this is Jay, I'll go ahead and, uh, and just say, first of all, thanks to both of you so far for, for your comments. I'll know if, um, it, it really was, it's been a, a time over the past year or so we, where we've had the tightest labor markets in 50 years, discussed this with many, if not all of you, and, and how things felt different and a uh, tight labor market really has a lot of benefits. And so it's, it's very, it's tragic, it's heartbreaking to see uh, that go away. And, uh, you know, our commitment, of course, is to get us back on the road to recovery and try to get back to that. We will not, we will not rest until we are back on that road and we'll push as hard as possible. Um, I was interested to hear you say, Duke, that the that the the relief from unemployment insurance and the checks is is getting through. That's good to hear. I'd love to hear if if others feel the same way. Um, and the the other thing is, uh, are you are people beginning to see uh, go back to? Is there any any sense of going back to work yet in in your community or or others? Is it, do you, do you start to feel people going back into the workplace now, or is it still too early for that? And how are people thinking about that? Well, I, I could take a stab at that if you can be so mind. Um, so under the Defense Production Act, the meat processing plants I just talked about were classified as essential infrastructure that have to remain open. And so the people there faced a decision that they needed to return to work or stay at home with probably very little or no income. Um, it's a very tough decision. And it became even more difficult for people who lived with somebody who was a high risk family member. So many of the people, so many of the people that I know, um, they view their parents and grandparents as fragile family treasures. And they've been very, very protective of them and keeping them sheltered in place. And it makes it tough if you're going there and you're working a shift. And I can tell you personally, uh, I provided care and transportation for my brother when he was battling cancer. And there is no way I would have taken him to chemo after doing a shift right beside somebody who we've now know, in fact, did test positive for it at one of these facilities. I would, I would just add, I think um, originally many of us thought uh, businesses would just close down and reopen. And in particular, in certain industries, we are just saying, seeing that those industries are shifting in a way that we didn't anticipate. Um, I think hospitality and healthcare, in particular, uh, who hire a lot of folks uh, who we are, who we care about, and who we're talking about, they've just changed in fundamental ways. Um, and I think we're not healthcare 
and um, hospitality were these industries that we thought were sort of sacred and protected from a lot of the other forces in the economy that we've worried about in the past. Um, and we're just seeing that that's not, that's not true. Um, if you work in hospitality, it has very low barriers. You can walk into that job. If you have a, if you have a union uh, hotel job in Chicago, you're making $20 an hour off the bat. There's not a, a parallel job to that for these folks. And those jobs aren't coming back, um, not coming back anytime soon. Um, healthcare, which we thought was, again, was sacred. Um, we're seeing layoffs. Uh, we're seeing people who are disconnected to these two industries that were experienced growth before. So I don't think we're seeing the people being reemployed like we thought we would see even three weeks ago. Weeks ago. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. So let me uh, continue on, uh, and then uh, again, I uh, invite my colleagues to come back in uh, after we've heard some uh, more of the panelists. Uh, so now I want to turn to Juan Delgado, who is Chancellor of the City Colleges of Chicago, and uh, Juan has focused his career on improving education and economic opportunities for residents in low-income communities. As chancellor, he oversees Chicago's community college system, working to put more than 70,000 students across seven colleges on the path to upward mobility. Juan, at our conference last June, you said that your students at the City Colleges of Chicago, who are largely African-American and Latinx, were benefiting from apprenticeship programs with local businesses and from having pathways to entry-level jobs that might historically have gone only to students with four-year degrees. These apprenticeship programs had been created in response to difficulties locating employees in what was then a very tight labor market. What's the state of these apprenticeship programs today? Do your students see the pandemic as a surmountable setback, or are they worried about lasting effects on their ability to get ahead? Well, uh, again, thank you for the uh, invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes. Very good. Um, I think I want to start by speaking about our students overall. Uh, you know, when you think about our students overall, they are students that uh, are in the low-wage labor market. They are working to upskill to get better opportunities, and this has been devastating to the wide, large number of students that we have in our system. Um, they are feeling the impacts in very formidable ways. Uh, but when it comes to the apprenticeship initiative, you know, I do want to give a little bit of hope here, right? Because the reality is, is that we have not seen our employers pull back, okay? We, in fact, had an employer just the other day took four of five apprentices as full-time employees and re-upped the double the number of apprentices they were doing before. Now, the apprentice program is still very small, but I do want to say that for those students that became apprentices, they uh, have a different and privileged place in society in relationship maybe to all the people around them, and that is that they're working from home. They still have jobs. They have an employer that's supportive of them, like you and I and all of us on this phone call have. When you think about what's happening to uh, Latinx and African-American communities, keep in mind that only one in five African-Americans can work from home. Only one in six Latinos can work from home. And so, you know, what we have done in the past through apprenticeship you know, is creating a circumstance uh, where th that is going to be life changing for these students, right? If they can keep that employer attachment. Um, and so far they have been, right? Because of the value they're providing to the company and the value that the companies provide um, and the workplace flexibility that exists um, in these particular industries. And of course, these were higher growth industries um, that you know are still fairly stable. And so what I want to say is that we should be looking to the things that were working before the pandemic as 
uh, strategies that we need to be going to doubling, tripling down on to get out of a pandemic, to make sure that equity is taken into account. And more than taken into account is at the forefront of how we respond to the pandemic. This is an opportunity for us to dream of and then realize never again to have double digit unemployment in one community in the same city where you have single digit employment uh, just a few miles away, unemployment just a few miles away, um, to have a nation with that kind of disparity. And so how do we design our solutions to ensure that that in fact is what occurs? And I gotta think that apprenticeship, you know, learning and learning is a key component. And I think that, you know, the attachment and um, the sustainability so far of that strategy um, is uh, bearing out that we ought to we ought to continue in that road. Thank you very much, Juan. So let me uh, pause for a second, see if we have any questions. Tin, you um, you know, with with classes and uh, enrollment, are you struggling with um, remote? Uh, you know, remote learning and tuition and all those sorts of things. And how are you thinking about the fall? The fall. Chair Pot, I appreciate you asking us that. We actually had a very successful transition to remote learning, um, but we were prepared for it in many respects. Learning management systems, employees that were trained already on Zoom that were utilizing this kind of technology, um, and to some degree students that were as well. Uh, I think that our pain points relate more to our students' pain points uh, as, as it relates to the fall itself. You know, one of the things that for any business and, you know, and certainly for an education and institution, you know, you've got to have some level of certainty that you can drive to the people you're going to serve. And that's probably the hardest part right now is that all we can give them is scenarios of what the learning environment might be. And the good news is they've had some exposure and some experience with the remote capability and the remote platform, uh, albeit forced upon them. I don't know how many are going to choose that platform, right, uh, voluntarily because of health and safety reasons. How many will choose to come to campus? Um, should we be able to come to campus? And we are certainly preparing for that. Uh, and so I think that we should keep our eye on, you know, the choices that people are making during this time and the impacts that that's going to have. And certainly we're guided by trying to provide as many choices as possible because every student is a world upon themselves. Um, the family networks, as we've talked before, you know, uh, you know they, they may make different choices based upon their living conditions, housing conditions family support structures, um, all of those things. And we have to be flexible uh, for them in that regard. The last thing I'll say, Chair Powell, is that community colleges, I think, will play a big role in the recovery um, because of our accessibility and our affordability and increasingly because of the quality that we provide. The well, thing you're providing them, do you, do you expect that most of them at least will be able to continue uh, with this in, in, the, in the current environment, with, with with the education they're getting from you, we, we, from you, we 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 are doing everything we can to support them. We do need, we do know that greater financial supports are going to be necessary because they are these workers um, that have lost their jobs, and certainly they've gotten some of them have gotten checks, um, and uh, some of them got emergency relief from us as well through the CARES Act. Uh, but we're going to have to find ways to support those students, uh, and we're raising philanthropic resources. Uh, for instance, we've raised nearly $3 million in the last three weeks uh, to actually help pay for tuition and looking at other mechanisms to have a retention high. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let me now turn uh, to Darren Williams. Darren's the CEO of Southern Bank Corps. Uh, a family of three community development financial institutions cons consisting of a bank holding company, a community bank, and a nonprofit loan fund serving 
low to moderate income communities in Arkansas and Mississippi. Offering financial products and financial development services focused on helping families build wealth and increase economic mobility, Southern Bancorp is a certified B Corp and member of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. It has 1.5 billion in assets and 400 employees serving 65,000 customers. Darren, a few years ago, you introduced me to Bernitha Jackson, one of your customers in Helena, Arkansas, who had gotten her first mortgage at the age of 63. We visited towns in the Mississippi Delta that have had a hard time retaining bank branches. Mission-oriented banks and CDFIs are truly financial first responders. Can you give us a sense of how low and moderate income communities in the Mississippi Delta are getting access to PPP loans and the recovery rebates that were included in the CARES Act and how those communities are weathering the COVID crisis? Thank you, Governor Brainerd, and um, to you and uh, Chairman Powell and distinguished members of the Federal Reserve Board, we appreciate you including Southern Bank Corp as a part of this important discussion. Um, Governor Brainerd, in anticipation of your question, I reached out to Rita Jackson on yesterday, and uh, she still remembers the meeting, and she told me to tell you hello. Uh, she wanted you to know that um, she's still enjoying her home, uh, that uh, she's in her husband work diligently on their yard. It's beautiful. She wished I could send you a picture, uh, but she wants you to know that she's doing well and building her wealth through home ownership, and very, very proud of her. Um, and fortunately for her, she's not impacted directly by COVID. Uh, her job is still safe with the school district, uh, and she has a beautiful home to come to uh, home to every day. Now, with regard to the Paycheck Protection Program, recognizing the importance of the loan proceeds in this Paycheck Protection Program, uh, Southern we aggressively reached out to our our customers uh, when the Paycheck Protection Program first rolled out. Uh, we recognize that those proceeds were, were, would, be, would be the lifeline for the communities that we serve in the Arkansas Mississippi Delta. Uh, and so on the very first day the program opened, on April 3rd, we actually processed and funded our very first loan. When many larger banks were uh, kind of stumbled out of the gate and did not really know how to access the program, proud to say that as of uh, yesterday, we've done over 1,225 PPP loans, PPP loans for over $110 million. Uh, and I can assure you that the loans that we've done have really reached the smallest of small businesses. In fact, um, in the first round, where we saw more, some of the larger small businesses, our average loan size is only $147,000. But in the second round, that average loan size has gone down to about $44,000. I will say over the last uh, 300 or so PV loans that we've done, uh, the average loan size is about $15,000. Uh, and in fact, in the first round, we did 553 PPP loans. 75% um, of those loans in round one went to businesses with 25 or fewer employees. We're seeing many, many more sole proprietors and independent contractors. And so the average loan size continues to come down. And over the last week, we've been averaging about uh, 10 loans per day uh, coming, through our, coming through our channels, through our 48 locations, uh, throughout our, our communities. And so we think that we are... Uh, we and other CDFIs across the country are really helping to reach some of the smallest of small businesses, and we really applaud Congress and the administration for having uh, the foresight to carve out in round two a small amount of resources that went, that went directly to um, the small business through, through CDFIs uh, and through small community banks. And I might note that the, the, the $30 billion that was carved out uh, for CDFIs and small community banks actually was exhausted in one and a half days. Uh, so you can see there's a rich demand for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, other, and I guess I might also point out that in Phillips County, uh, Governor Brandon, where you visited Ms. Jackson, uh, we actually did 125 PPP loans for about $7.6 million. That's a, that's a county uh, of less than 12,000 people. Uh, and so, again, the PPP loan proceeds have been a lifeline for the employees that have been able to access that program. Um, now, with regard to, the, to, to um, some of the other CARES Act programs, uh, particularly the, the federal stimulus checks, uh, we have uh, been inundated with um, uh, people wanting to cash uh, those checks. Uh, in fact, uh, between April 15th and May 17th, um, $32 million in stimulus proceeds have come through our bank, either through 
direct ACHs uh, to our customers who had their accounts um, on file with IRS or through people who came through our drive throughs to actually cash those checks. And because it was so important for us uh, that customers and non-customers have access to cash those checks, we cash non-customers checks without any fees at all uh, to make sure that they were able to, able to secure the vast majority of those proceeds. In the markets we serve, particularly in, in Mississippi and Governor Brandon, you saw this, they're, in, they're, they're just inundated with, with pay, payday loan service centers and, pay, and, and check cashers, which take a large percentage of even government checks uh, to cash. And so we cash those uh, at no fee uh, to folks that came through our, <coughs> our drive through since we, of course, now our lobbies are closed. Uh, so that was about 20,000 transactions we've seen so far, and they still continue to, to trickle in. Unfortunately, Arkansas and Mississippi have some of the highest un- and underbank rates uh, in America, with about 26% and 38% respectively in Arkansas and Mississippi that are uh, on or underbanked. And so it's important that we provide that support. For, uh, for other customers, we really um, try to make sure that we're helping them bear uh, the impacts of COVID-19. So for our consumer loan customers, we provided a, a three-month payment holiday of principal and interest on any loan for our consumer customers. And on a case-by-case -case basis, we talk with our uh, commercial loan co customers, provide them with also various forms of payment relief, from interest-only payments to complete deferrals of payments. And then, of course, the SBA provided uh, payment relief for our SBA borrowers. I will say that uh, since we've done that, about 15% of our entire portfolio has taken advantage of some form of payment relief. So we've got about $150 million uh, in, um, in some type of payment deferral uh, out of our billion-dollar loan portfolio. Now, I'm not sure that everyone needed that, that, that relief, but people are frightened. They're scared. They're nervous. Uh, people wanted to hold on to as much cash as possible, uh, and so they took advantage of those, uh, that, that relief. Additionally, we are really promoting right now online and our mobile product, uh, really trying to move people to those, those platforms. We've also raised, raised various uh, fees um, as, as we experience these COVID-19 issues for mobile, uh, mobile deposit fees to uh, late payment fees. We've, we've waived many of those. And as a, as a CDFI that focuses heavily on providing financial literacy, financial counseling, what we call financial development services, uh, we are really pushing our financial counseling, and we're doing that more and more through Zoom. Uh, and so our credit counselors are actually talking to people uh, via Zoom from their home uh, to people's homes, really trying to help them weather the, the impact of COVID-19. So all in all, I would say that in the adult community that we serve, um, we have faced economic, tough economic conditions for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> the market that we serve looks very, very much like what Amanda talked about earlier, uh, with double-digit uh, unemployment even pre-COVID, when uh, employment rates throughout the country were much less. So these markets have faced higher unemployment, higher job loss, higher poverty, as a result of structural inequalities and deficiencies in our economic system. And this hadn't gone away. My fear is that long-term impact on COVID-19 would only broaden these inequalities uh, in income and in wealth in the communities that we serve. <clears throat> and you can look at the research by Sergo Foundation, which really talked about those communities that are vulnerable have a, have a community vulnerability index. And it's not necessarily the communities that are having the most health impact from COVID-19. It's those that had a number of structural challenges, like the Arkansas Mississippi Delta, that would have a long-term long -term impact of COVID-19. <clears throat> In fact, the FEMA disaster studies show that 40% of the you know, businesses that are affected by disaster never return. Uh, and of the 40, of those 6% that do return, about one-third don't last two years after the disaster. So we're concerned uh, about the impact. We're, we're, we're resilient. We're going to try to make it through, but, but, but the structural inequalities in our system really make it difficult uh, for the markets that we serve. And we really appreciate you um, all inviting us to be a part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. It's a good reminder that uh, financial services are uh, often uh, emergency services uh, when when we have a uh, national emergency such as this. I think we're all proud also of the role we've been playing, helping to make sure those ACH transfers get there and helping banks and CDFIs get access to their PPP funds. I'm wondering whether Mickey wanted to come in on uh, that front. Yes, thank you, Lael. And Darren, it's wonderful to hear the stories of, of you meeting the needs of your customers and waiving fees 
uh, and and meeting the needs of the unbanked and underbanked to cash their stimulus checks. That's uh, the role that I see community banks playing across the country, and it's refreshing to hear you um, reaffirm uh, those activities. I wondered um, if you might be able to, to sh cast a little light on the differences that you're seeing between rural areas and the economic impacts you're seeing there or any developments versus your ur more urban areas. And is there anything more that the Fed can do to manage the current environment there? Governor Bowman, thank you for that, for that question. And I really appreciate your always bringing the, the angle of community banking uh, as you think about the work that uh, having been a community banker. Um, you know, so Southern, uh, the market we serve uh, in, by most accounts would all be considered rural. The largest town that we serve is probably a city of 45,000 people. Now, we call that urban or large, uh, but we also serve towns, you know, of less than 1,000 people. Um, we, we do see some differences in, in those communities. So those more populated communities where people have access to more uh, business technical assistance, have access to CPAs and other um, other business um, uh, technical providers, they're having an opportunity to, to really access those PPP programs. So I was talking just recently to a gentleman in uh, Forest City, Arkansas, one of the most uh, economically challenged communities in our, in our state of Arkansas, uh, and he had about 15 um, of his customers he was working with that had not been able to access the PPP program, and, and I really started digging in trying to figure out could we help him. And these were businesses that unfortunately uh, have relied on informal accounting systems, uh, cash-based businesses, or even some who have just a complete mistrust of banks uh, and don't have a banking relationship. Uh, and you see that in more of your rural underserved communities. Uh, so there is somewhat of a difference, and uh, we're uh, we're trying to figure out ways to help them. Uh, through our nonprofit loan fund, we've created a philanthropic grant program uh, where we're trying to provide uh, forgivable loans or really grants to those who've not been able to access the PDP program, those dollars are very limited, uh, but they're important because we know so many people have not had access to the PDP uh, program. Thank you very much. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, uh, turn to some of our small business or business owners. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with uh, Bob Ucrop, who is chairman and CEO of Ucrop's Homestyle Foods. Located in Richmond, uh, the company employs 400 associates and produces high quality chilled prepared foods and baked goods for supermarket chains that we all have heard of, Food Lion, Harris Teeter, Kroger, Publix, Wegman. The family owned uh, business was formed in 2010 after the family sold its previous 73 year old retail business, uh, which were uh, supermarket stores. So, uh, Bobby, one year ago, I heard you talk about how your food preparation firm couldn't raise wages because you couldn't easily pass on those price increases to your customers, given the thin margins in grocery and fierce competition from other sellers. You also described challenges you were facing in finding and retaining good employees who could maintain high-quality food standards while also working in challenging conditions. I'm wondering what kinds of changes you've been seeing with the COVID crisis in terms of working conditions and uh, employee uh, availability, and how have the demand for your products and your pricing and margins changed uh, in uh, this period? Thanks for the opportunity to participate today. It's great to hear what Darren did most recently, but the work his organization is doing to help folks. It's just wonderful to hear that. Our sales are down 25% since the COVID-19 crisis began. And of course, some people are in a lot worse shape than that. But the reasons why, are, although supermarkets report that sales are up significantly, there has been a shift in what consumers are buying, resulting in lower margins for retailers. They're reluctant to go to the grocery store frequently, consumers are spending much more per trip as they buy more shelf-stable products and more proteins from the meat department. For our company, sales of fresh products to support food service areas like salad bars and hot food bars went to zero as stores stopped offering these options. Sales of packaged, chill-prepared foods, um, including entrees, sides, and deli salads um, have remained strong. However, sales of sandwiches and green salads 
most often purchased by office workers for lunch, are down significantly. Sales of baked goods, especially iced and decorated cakes, are much lower because of fewer gatherings and celebrations. Consumers are using the extra time at home themselves to bake pies and cakes. But there are even more unintended consequences. For example, the huge disruption of the food industry supply chain. Many food retailers' distribution centers were overwhelmed by demand for cleaning supplies, paper goods, and frozen food, like pizza. So in some cases, F products were not deemed to be priority items, and they stopped ordering. Also, to avoid hoarding by individual stores and the store personnel who might try to stock up on extremely fast-selling items, some retailers prevented employees from making adjustments to computer-generated orders. As for pricing and margins, not much has changed since last year when we instituted a 2% price increase and ways ra raised wages 3%. Now, in our business, under normal circumstances, it has taken more than six months for our retailer, our retail customers, our partners, to accept and then execute price increase. Before the COVID-19 COVID crisis arrived, we had planned to implement a wage increase this fall. That initiative is up in the air at this point. The only price increase we anticipate would relate to recent spikes in protein, especially beef as the supply chain has been very disrupted. As for our workforce and our working conditions, our associates are accustomed to stringent health and sanitation protocols, and the temperature in our kitchen is 35 degrees. All of us have heightened awareness about health and safety. Our associates, however, want to work. And we did receive support from a PPP loan. That loan was very timely as it enabled us to keep everyone on the payroll when sales were significantly down and much uncertainty was present. We applied for the PP loan, PPP loan to Atlantic Union Bank, the largest community bank in Virginia, on the first day. Pleased to report that within a week we had the money, and that gave us confidence in our decision to keep all of our associates on the payroll. Frankly, I was amazed how quickly the delivery system worked. Numerous business friends and area organizations had similar experiences because of their relationships with locally controlled banks. For you cross home style food, that PPP loan is a bridge to the summer when we anticipate somewhat of a sales rebound. Unfortunately, many smaller businesses did not have a personal relationship with a bank or even a bank. Some may have known only a teller and others had no connectivity. These businesses really, really need help. And back to our wonderful associates, our absenteeism rate has not changed. One reason our associates come to work is they need a stable paycheck because many also work part-time jobs. And a good number of those jobs no longer exist, as I mentioned earlier. In addition, other members of their family may have lost jobs, so a secure job at UCROPS is appreciated. Now, a number of our associates do get irritated some of their out-of-work friends and family members are making more money by drawing on employment benefits, which include the temporary federal subsidy. We strongly believe the vast majority, and this was said by other people, the vast majority of people want to work. Thank you very much, uh, Bobby, uh, for that uh, update. Um, I'm going to pause and see whether uh, I have uh, any questions from my colleagues. And if not, what I'm going to do is go on um, to hear from Joanne Cheng and then pause again because uh, both Joanne and Bobby are uh, running businesses and so uh, similar questions might arise. So Joanne Cheng is the co-owner of Flower Bakery and uh, Myers Chang, along with her husband and business partner, Christopher Myers. She's also a cookbook author, and her most recent cookbook, Pastry Love, has just been nominated for Best Pastry Book by the James Beard Foundation for 2020. So congratulations, Joanne. Joanne, last May, you spoke of the squeeze your flower bakery restaurants faced, stuck between raising the wages you pay in order to attract workers in the Boston area an intense competition in the restaurant business that made it difficult for you to increase prices. 
with social distancing, the landscape for restaurants has changed dramatically. How have you adapted your restaurant's business model to COVID requirements, and what does this mean for the people that you employ? Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Governor and Chair. Um, so Christopher and I own and operate uh, eight sit-down cafes. We were in the middle of opening up a ninth and a sit-down restaurant. Uh, Pre-COVID, we saw between 10 and 12,000 people a day, uh, and we made the decision to shut down all of the locations for about five weeks, middle of March, um, because Massachusetts, especially some areas in Boston, were considered a hot spot. Um, so we ended up furloughing 490 out of 500 team members immediately. Um, we went from over 100,000 in sales daily to zero, just overnight. Uh, and we needed that time to figure out how to operate safely for our teams and our guests, um, as, you know, amid this crisis. Um, luckily for us, we are a popular takeout spot, um, both the, bake the bakeries and the restaurants. Um, uh, so to answer your question of adapting the COVID requirements, honestly, there haven't really been COVID requirements that have been established for cafes and restaurants. So, you know, we are kind of playing it by ear and doing our very best to anticipate and act on we can parse together just from reading, um, you know, everything we can and watching everything we can. Uh, we're starting to open our locations up slowly. Um, uh, and at this point, about half of our locations are back open and our sales uh, are down about, um, I wish they were at Bobby's percentage at 25%, but we're actually down about 75 to 80%. Uh, and so because of that, um, and because of social distancing, we've actually reduced our staffing um, by 80%. Um, again, we had furloughed everybody and now we're slowly starting to bring people back and we're at about 80% um, of what we were. We have reduced our operating hours at the bakeries and the restaurants that, that are open uh, because we're trying to limit the number of shifts, um, trying to minimize you know, overlap and all of that stuff. Um, we're also limiting staffing to people uh, who can get to work by either car uh, or by walking or biking or scooter. Um, we're not allowing people to take public transportation or Uber just yet because we don't feel comfortable. They don't feel comfortable, to be honest. Um, and so that has put a little bit of a damper on who we can bring back, uh, but we have actually changed a little bit and started a driving department. And so we've rented a couple vans and we are physically picking people up, um, going to uh, subway stops where they used to, to uh, you know, take the tea into work. And now we're, we're acting as the tea. Um, we are also reworking people's uh, responsibilities. Um, you know, what Duke was saying earlier about how the stronger skills that people will uh, end up probably having a little bit more success overall in all of this. Um, we're definitely seeing that in that uh, the first people to come back have been managers and they will probably end up being redeployed um, and doing many more things than what they were before managing because there's uh, not as much, not as many people to manage, honestly, and we just need more boots on the ground. And so their job responsibilities are going to shift a little bit. Um, we're selling, uh, similar to what Bobby said, we're selling so much more stuff online than we ever were. Um, we're, we're also pushing to sell groceries. I mean, we're a bakery cafe, we're a restaurant, and uh, we're selling quarts of flour, quarts of uncooked rice, um, make your own chocolate cream pie kits, anything and everything to just try to get some sales in the door. Um, uh, to address the May comments about raising wages and, and uh, raising prices, we did raise wages in the short term uh, because uh, as I think Bobby was just saying, so many of our team members could make more on unemployment, and we recognized that by coming back and helping us reopen, they were going to take a pay cut. So we have temporarily raised wages, but we don't anticipate we will be able to continue that. Uh, we're probably going to have to stop that middle of June, which coincides with when our PPP loan ends. Uh, with the cost of rent and uh, benefits and food and just everything that's going on. Um, really, the only model that does work is for us to increase our prices, but, you know, is that sustainable? We're, we're not really sure. You know, time will tell. We're starting discussions with our landlords on rent and what that will look like in the future. Um, rent used to be between 5 and 10% uh, of our um, sales, and now it's 20 to 25%, so that's certainly not sustainable. Um, in terms of what this means for the people that we employed, um, for the ones who are currently working, they are all honestly wondering if they should be because they, they think maybe they should go back on unemployment where they will continue to get um, some assistance. Uh, but they are, I 
think, again, sort of like Bobby's team, they are recognizing that they're a part of trying to help the economy kind of get back on track and to help our company get back on track. Um, many of our uh, staff members are students um, working part-time, um, counter-help baristas, and many of them just went home. Boston is a huge college town, uh, and as soon as all of the universities shut down, they all went home. Um, and then, uh, honestly, for the people who are now currently working, um, tend to be the people who uh, were not able to apply for benefits. Uh, they were the first ones to raise their hands and saying, we want to come back in any way possible. They don't have any safety net. Um, they rely 100% on their jobs to pay for food and rent. Um, so these are the people who want to come back now. So we're doing our best to employ as many of them as we can. And we're pushing to increase our sales volume um, so that we can you know, continue to bring back as, as many as possible. So we certainly hope to be able to grow to the point where we need everybody back. But realistically, with social distancing, um, we don't think that's going to be the case. Thank you, Joanne. So questions for uh, Joanne or Bobby? Uh, for Joanne, um, if you went over this, I, uh, I may have missed it. But so are there, have you been able to reopen uh, or keep open any of the restaurants? Uh, and how are you thinking about that? I mean, that's obviously the part uh, that, that's where an awful lot of the layoffs have been happening at the national level, a very, very difficult uh, part of the economy right now. Part of the economy right now. So we've re reopened um, four of the cafes and the restaurant. And uh, we are only doing pickup, pre-order pickup and takeout. And so you can't physically come into the restaurant. Um, we're not allowed to in Boston right now, but even when the governor allows us to, we don't know if we're going to let people come in. Uh, we're going to see if we can continue to, with this takeout model. Uh, but we've had to reduce the number of staff in the restaurant because of social distancing. So we used to have between 13 and 15 people physically working at the restaurant at any one time, and now we're at about eight. Um, and we have uh, half of the kitchen is now in the dining room because we need to separate all of the kitchen prep. The, um, the cafes in the near term then you're you're working on the business model you have you don't it's you don't feel like you're weeks or months away from being able to reopen to the public in a way that where they come in and eat yet or what's your what's your thinking on that business model in terms of a model in terms of allowing people to physically come into the cafes and the restaurants um that's probably i'm guessing at least a month away i mean eventually we will open to the public and let them come in uh, but our business model really was, I mean, like most restaurants, it's pack as many people as you can in one space, um, you know, big waiting area for people to stand at the bar or near the sandwich area where they're waiting for sandwiches. So we know we're going to have to limit that um, when we do physically allow people to come into the cafes and restaurants. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to... Um, turn to uh, Janie Barrera, who uh, knows uh, small business finances from the other side. She is founding president and CEO of Lyft Fund, and since 1994, Lyft Fund has provided loans and management training to enterprises from startups to long-established businesses and operates in 13 states in the southeast region of the U.S. Lift Fund has dispersed more than 21,000 loans, totaling more than 300 million to unbanked and underbanked small businesses with a 94% repayment rate. So Janie, at our conference last June, you talked about the small business borrowers your CDFI is serving in the Colonias, in the Delta, in other areas in the Southeast. And you emphasized that with FICO store scores of around 580, and here I'm quoting from you, the interest rate is not the most important thing to our borrower, it is access to capital. With COVID having especially devastating impacts on the finances of small businesses, what are you seeing with your borrowers? How much can they fall back on cash reserves or family and friends to stay current on their payments? How is that affecting their own incomes and their ability to retain their employees? And how accessible is the PPP program for them and for you? Um, thank you, Governor Brainard, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share this information. Access to capital is still the most important need for our small business owners. In the 26 years that I've been president and CEO of Lift Fund, I've never seen a greater need in our communities. 
Uh, LIFON's headquarters is located in, in San Antonio. You may have seen uh, an image that was put out on national television recently about um, the lineup of cars uh, at the food bank because of the uh, city of San Antonio has a poverty rate of, of about 25%. And so there are many people without jobs. And so um, if you think about the portfolio in not only San Antonio, but across our footprint, it's mostly, um, you know, service businesses uh, and restaurants and gyms. And so these businesses have been, you know, have been devastated. So what Lift Fund did, first of all, was that we gave four months of deferred payment to the business owners in our portfolio. And then we began working with municipalities and offering grants and small loans to businesses with less than 10 employees and annual revenues of less than a million dollars. Uh, the loans are up to $25,000 at 0% interest, and there are no payments for, uh, for four months. We started making these loans in late March. Uh, you know, LIFUN is mostly a micro lender. Annually, we make about 1,000 loans dispersing between $25 and $30 million. In the last two months, we have made over 800 loans, totaling more than $25 million. This includes the PPP and COVID-related loans only. In the PPP portfolio, we have 539 loans. The average loan size is about 30,000, but we've experienced PPP loans of as little as $1,000. So our challenge right now is reaching those businesses that are scared of taking on debt. They don't, you know, with this unsecurity, they don't, under, they don't know that it can become working capital as well. So it's that whole education that we're um, doing right now with our small business owners across our footprint. On the COVID loan, uh, loans, our average is about $20,000. Uh, Lifland also received donations to make grants to small business owners. We received about $1.7 million in grants that we distributed, distributed back as grants to over 300 businesses. We also received a special grant for veterans. Uh, the grants, this, this grant paid for four months of principal and interest payments for the veterans in the portfolio. So the majority of these loans that I'm describing and grants have gone to minorities, 76% uh, minorities and 40% women. Uh, the work is not over because now the munici municipalities are receiving federal dollars and we are here to help those, uh, help them get these dollars into the hands of the small business owners. We took a survey this, uh, this week, actually, of 300 of our borrowers in our portfolio. 56% stated that they had temporarily or partially closed their business. 56% have experienced a reduction in their non-business household income. And 18% are not sure if they will be open in January. So we are working hard to see how we can help them keep alive. So the funds that the municipalities are receiving right now are grants that they're receiving and that the municipalities have to put out to the small business communities in grants so that they can rehire or uh, or hire hire new employees buy merchandise uh, prepare the business for um, you know the, the social distancing that um, that we have to have in place as you've heard already so we see our job is not only providing the access to capital uh, but also to uh, helping them come up with plans to survive um, this next year. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. Uh, any questions? I'm, I'm curious, um, are you also, like Darren, uh, pretty much able to meet the demand for PPP loans? It sounds like uh, that's been something you've been able to do quite a bit of as well. Yes, the the, uh, the demand has slowed, and so again, it's the the more sophisticated businesses, the ones that actually have payroll, the third party, or they use QuickBooks. You know, that was a piece of cake for them to um, be able to access the PPP funds. Now it's really getting into the grassroots, um, to, uh, small small businesses that we're trying to reach. Every day, you know, we're out there. Uh, you know, being on webinars, being on television, saying it's okay to apply, you need to apply. And, and a lot of sole proprietorships as well, you know, the guy who cuts the grass or the, you know, the, the woman who had maybe a small hair shop of her own, they said, well, I don't have any employees. Well, no, you're the employee. 
uh, you qualify for a PCP loan. Oh, okay. How do you do that? We go to Schedule C, look at, you know, line 31, you know, divide that by 12 and so on. So we've had to do so much education, sir, to be able to reach that, that group of folks that traditionally are not being um, located. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So let me turn now. Um, I think we'll go to uh, households. Um, and I'm going to turn uh, to Aaron Gornstein, who's the president and CEO of Preservation of Affordable Housing. HOA is a national nonprofit that owns and manages nearly 12,000 affordable apartments in 11 states and DC. Aaron also serves as the chair of the Board of Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future and New Lease for Homeless Families in Massachusetts. Aaron, last May, you spoke about how important securing and retaining a job is for the economic mobility of the 18,000 residents in the affordable apartments your organization provides in New England and around the country. You stated that affordable housing organizations need to think much more about workforce and jobs and how to move people up the economic ladder. We have to focus a lot more on job retention and promotion so people can succeed in maintaining the job, we need to focus on transitioning people from rental housing to home ownership as much as possible. So how are your residents facing today? How are COVID-related financial stresses affecting uh, the residents of these uh, affordable apartments? And what are you seeing in terms of job losses and the ability they have to make their rent payments? Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on the housing challenges facing the country in light of the pandemic. Uh, POA provides affordable apartments to nearly 20,000 low-income families, seniors, people with disabilities, with average incomes of approximately $16,000 annually. The health and safety of our residents is in our paramount concern, and we've implemented many new protocols at our properties to minimize their health risks. We're also helping our residents to meet urgent needs by conducting wellness calls, coordinating food assistance, helping them to apply for unemployment benefits, and also addressing mental health and social isolation, particularly for the seniors. And like most other low-income families, our, man our residents are managing through the crisis, um, but they're facing significant challenges at the same time. Chief among them is the lack of access to childcare now, and having to homeschool their children, often without the necessary tools that they need, all the while struggling to meet monthly expenses with very limited or no savings. And recent studies have found that low-income renters are particularly vulnerable to the economic impacts of this pandemic. An Urban Institute analysis, for example, found that these households are more likely to work in the five industries experiencing the greatest number of layoffs. You asked about rent collections and national data indicates that the rent collections are down by approximately five to 10% in April compared to previous months. This is less of a decline than some had predicted, but it's still significant. And this drop is true for POA as well, but it varies across properties and locations. Many properties are facing much sharper decline in rent revenue as much as 20 to 30% due to tenants experiencing higher levels of unemployment or lacking rental assistance. In addition, uh, in the coming months, we expect the situation to get much worse. While many renters have been helped by the CARES Act, and the chairman had asked about that, but certainly that's been true in various other supports, we're very concerned about what happens once this assistance ends and the eviction moratoria at the federal, state, and local levels also end. The confluence of these events is likely to happen around September 1st, at which point millions of renters will be at risk of displacement and homelessness. Therefore, we think immediate action is needed at the federal level to provide rental assistance to help tenants remain stably housed over the next year, while also ensuring 
that owners can pay their mortgages, keep up with the local property taxes, and maintain their properties. I want to finish up by highlighting the need for new multifamily construction to meet the immediate needs and to help jumpstart the economic recovery. Harvard's Joint Center for Housing found, found that 5.3 million rental households with, were at risk uh, and were cost burdened prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. It projects that this number will rise to 9.3 million as a result of the crisis. These are families with at-risk wages. Clearly, more affordable housing is needed to meet this growing demand. The good news is there's a healthy pipeline of projects that are shovel ready. The financing markets remain relatively stable and a strong existing CRA provides appropriate private market incentives. Of course, we hope that continues. However, there are funding gaps in construction budgets because of, of at least two factors. An increased cost to comply with COVID-19 construction standards and I think more importantly, a drop in the 4% housing tax credit rate to 3.07%, the lowest on record. Compounding the problem is a reduction in housing resources from state and local governments, which are facing enormous budget deficits, as you know. Fortunately, there's a simple, quick solution. Congress could pass a minimum 4% housing credit rate. This was done, as you probably know, for the 9% tax credit rate several years ago. Doing so, along with increasing capital grant programs, would greatly expand affordable housing opportunities for the millions of low-income families and seniors who will desperately need it in the coming months. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Well, thank you, Aaron, and uh, I'm glad you uh, reminded us of what a vital role CRA plays uh, in uh, all of these activities. I am going to pause just for a second to see if uh, any of my colleagues have a question, and then we'll go on to our final panelist. Question on um, you mentioned at the end uh, support from state and local governments. Uh, is that a, is that a big factor in in uh, these markets for affordable housing? Very much so. In, very much so. In any developer trying to do affordable housing, whether you're preserving existing units or building new construction, you're tapping into state and local government funding, what we call soft funds or gap funding. And you're putting that together with the low-income housing tax credit resources at the federal level. So it takes a real partnership between all three levels of government and the private sector to get housing built. And when you pull the rug out from any of those, it's going to affect the ability of um, affordable housing developers to move forward and create more homes. Thank you. All right. And uh, we're going to uh, wrap up uh, focusing on uh, one of the segments um, that uh, has been uh, disproportionately affected by this crisis. Uh, as we turn to Nancy Lamond, who is AARP's Executive Vice President and Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer. At uh, AARP, she oversees government relations, advocacy campaigns, and public education programs. In the financial security area, Nancy leads efforts to strengthen Social Security and promote retirement savings initiatives, as well as programs that deliver unbiased tools and information to help people make effective financial decisions. So Nancy, last October, you spoke of the tremendous economic anxiety of older Americans who you said were already beginning to get more worried about the economy. How are older Americans feeling today and how are they coping with the combination of the COVID crisis and the sharp economic downturn we're facing? Well, Governor Brainerd, Chair Powell, and other members of the Federal Reserve, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you. I've, I've uh, learned a lot listening to other panelists. Well, you're right. In October, in a very good economy, I commented how older Americans uh, were beginning to get nervous about the economy, and I think probably without saying too much more, I can say they're even more nervous now. Um, and AARP, as many of you know, is an organization, people over the age of 50, we have 38 million members. And during this period, we've done a lot of outreach to them. Uh, we do polling all the time. 
We do teletown halls every week, typically 80 to 100,000 people are phoning in, sending us questions and also our call center. So we feel as if we have a pretty good sense of what's going on, but of course, um, uh, we can always do more both to understand and also try to respond to some of the fears. I would say overall, the key thing is uh, older Americans are very, very focused on the health aspects of the pandemic. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. They are the most worried about themselves, but their anxiety isn't just for themselves. It's for their kids and their grandkids. Um, they are, I should say, and this is consistent in terms of some of the economic data I'll mention later, older women are much more worried than older men. Um, and on almost every poll we do, every scale, women are about 10 or 12 points more anxious about both healthcare and the, the economy. Uh, they are taking precautions. If you look at um, any kind of indicators of self distancing, listening to information. Um, older Americans are glued to their TV sets. They are online. They are reading more local information. And they're very focused on what public health officials have to say. Very interested in kind of healthcare information. I joke all the time that if you ask an older person who their favorite um, uh, individual in the world is it's their grandchild, but the second most favorite person is their doctor. And uh, it may even be a little more even right now. Um, so as we go ahead, um, there's one important kind of poll figure um, uh, survey that we're looking at, and that's um, kind of level of worry about lifting restrictions too early. And as recently as a couple of weeks ago, Three quarters of people over the age of 65 and two thirds of people 50 to 64 say they were very, very worried about opening up too quickly, the virus spreading, um, and then people having to go back in. And we all look at a lot of indicators of consumer confidence, but I'm watching this one very carefully because I think people's comfort level about going back out. Remember, older Americans, half of them are financially very challenged. The other half do have disposable income. They travel, um, they're movie goers, they're restaurant goers. And so I think we're all gonna wanna watch how comfortable they feel about opening up, um, opening up in light of what they're hearing about health concerns. Now, moving on to financial uh, matters, which obviously are uh, front and center for them as well. We're hearing from older Americans who have lost their jobs and are depleting their savings, struggling to pay bills, and managing with limited or reduced income. We have a lot of calls to our call center, more than you'd wanna know, about people not getting their stimulus checks and having trouble filing for and getting unemployment. And so we're very active in that area. I would also say that you know we've run a fraud watch network for many years, and we have 10 times the number of calls every day that we did three months ago. And I can say there is one part of the economy that is growing, and that's the scammer part of the economy. Um, and I think a number of organizations like ours are redoubling our efforts to try to help people during this time. Remember, this is a period where people at home and they're answering their phones much more than they used to. And so they're much more susceptible to, uh, uh, to scammers. Um, we're watching uh, the unemployment rate for people over the age of 50 and 55 is growing. Um, it's higher for women right now than men, according to the data we've seen. And we think some of the longer term implications of this are that we're hearing a lot more concern about how long is it going to take me if I can get back in the labor force. It usually takes older um, Americans a little bit longer to get jobs when they've been laid off. And uh, we're, of course, hearing about uh, are we going to be active on issues related to age discrimination down the line. So people are clearly thinking about what is going to happen um, when the economy starts back up and there is uh, rehiring. Uh, it wouldn't surprise you that in our polling, people are showing dramatically more concern about their financial condition. If you're over the age of 65 and you're retired, you're, of course, very focused on your 401k uh, plan. You're very focused on the stock market, very focused on social, social security. Remember also retired Americans have benefited from the gig economy. We all thought the gig economy was built for millennials. Well, it turned out that older Americans were 
supplementing their retirement as Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, the largest growing cohort in the Airbnb world were women over the age of 55 wanting to have people come to their house, help them pay off their uh, um, both mortgage and property taxes. So the retired community has suffered a little bit in ways you wouldn't have thought from the kind of cutback of uh, part-time part -time jobs. And then of course, there's the pessimism we're beginning to see about, will I be able to retire? Um, will I really be able to count on uh, what I had in my 401k being enough and how am I going to move ahead? So uh, I would say that um, uh, older Americans are quite nervous in the current environment um, and anxious to uh, see the virus under control so they can, uh, they can move back to at least somewhere close to where they were before. Thank you, Nancy. So I'm looking at the time and uh, the sound does not sound great. Uh, let me see if, um, given the few minutes we have left, if we can do a lightning round, maybe we'll get through half of uh, our panelists. Um, I just want you to, you know, sort of recognizing we're still in what could be described as the fog of war. I'd like to ask you nonetheless to try to look ahead and just ask whether you think COVID will alter the landscape for the work that you do and the communities you serve and whether you think there will be lasting changes as a result of this pandemic. Um, and I'm going to start uh, again with Amanda. Sorry for not giving you a, a, a chance to, to give some thought to it, but just a 45 second answer. Sure. I think um, our collaborators around the country will be busy learning from each other throughout this recovery. Uh, without a lack of sort of a national response, uh, this experience has been very localized and we're going to have these cities really rely on each other to come up with creative solutions. So, you know, what can Baltimore teach Chicago? What can Cleveland learn from Pittsburgh? Um, we're going to lead into industry partnership. Uh, industries are going to have to figure out the new normal and businesses within an industry are going to have to work on some of those big looming questions. Um, we will probably continue to support businesses to help them support their frontline workers um, through financial wellness programs so that they could better uh, survive the next financial hit or uh, making sure worker voices are included and in how to create a healthy and safe workplace. Um, and then for us, the, you know, the big, they're sort of gigantic policy questions. Um, there's no way to get out of this without relying on our public institutions uh, to protect us from some of the economic harm that's been done. And we know last time that that happened, you know, when we had an unemployment crisis of this magnitude, we created the New Deal. Um, and it intentionally left out uh, black and brown workers. And we're seeing the effects of that today. Uh, there's a reason why black and brown workers are overrepresented in the service industry. There's a reason labor law doesn't cover a lot of their jobs. And as we create policies and think about the future, we just need to make sure we're not setting people up to be victims of the next crisis and that we're rebuilding an economy that really works for everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Duke? Yeah, thank you. So um, on March 12th, the NCAA Big 12 basketball tournament was canceled. On March 13th, the stagehands tore down everything they'd set up for that. All events were canceled from that point forward. None of them have worked at all in 10 weeks now. And I just saw on the news today that major concerts aren't going to start until sometime late 2021. So these are entire industries that most people haven't even thought about that are going to be impacted and workers who are going to have a long, long time before they come back. Thank you. Juan. Yeah, ed education is going to be transformed. In the short run, it's very painful. Uh, it, it, the adjustment is very hard on many people mostly on our students in inequitable ways. Uh, but I think there might be some opportunity points. We're learning um, the importance of households and families and parents <laughs> in a way that, you know, we should have known from the very beginning and, um, and appreciated and tapped in in greater ways. And so there's a depth to the relationships with families. There's a connection between teachers and parents um, that is greater and deeper than ever before. Uh, so I think if education takes advantage of the opportunity from a um, from the perspective of, um, of of what the positive things that we've come from this, although 
you know, the pain is very great. And so my concern is that we won't be able to, you know, sift through the pain in order to see the opportunity. But um, it's going to be transformed. That's my prediction. Thank you. Darren. Governor uh, Brainerd, I couldn't agree more with some of the things that Amanda said. We're really concerned about the structural inequalities uh, that exist in the um, uh, current system and how they may be exacerbated through, the, through this. If this continues to, 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 to last and kind of is fully open, clearly we're going to be concerned about our asset quality. Um, and, and, and that's something that we're going to be taking a very, very close look at. If consumers are not spending, um, then folks that pay mortgage and pay rents and things will have, have to open. Uh, the one thing I, I, I would say is uh, that's directly related to the work of the Federal Reserve, the Main Street Relenting Program that you guys have, uh, uh, have worked on. Um, I applaud you for removing, uh, for lowering the um, size of it from one million to half, half a million dollars. Uh, I would say that the four-year term uh, is pro still problematic for some of our some of our borrowers. Um, uh, that's that's probably uh, too quick of an amortization period for them to still make for expected cash flow. Uh, and then I would say as we continue. Um, I do think we're going to continue to reimagine what banking looks like. Uh, we're moving, and before COVID, even more rapidly now, we're moving more and more toward a digital platform. So it has a very, very rich, innovative history. One of our founding uh, board members uh, founded the company that was precursor to what is, is Fiserv today. We own a part of our own core processor today. And we're moving very, very forward and aggressively in a digital platform, being able to provide financial products and services that are responsive and responsible in a digital platform to really focus on our mission at scale, so well beyond our Arkansas and Mississippi borders. Thank you. Bobby. 31 years ago, um, and people were started to have kind of what we would call a time star of the world, where people didn't have time to get the kids to practices, to go to evening meetings, because uh, parents were working outside the home, no time to cook, and people were asking, what's for dinner tonight? And so with what's happened is a lot of people spend a lot more time at home one of the questions is with the social distancing issues before us, how quickly are people going to move back to this time starved world? And what impact will that continue to have, have on their, their buying habits, especially for food? Thinking about how, what kind of consumer conference will there be to go back to salad bars, the hot bars, the other situations where they're not sure of. And so somehow, um, hopefully we can all work together and these things will not take as long as we might think it might, but it's going to be a challenge. All right. I am actually going to hand it back to Chair Powell at this juncture because we are uh, in the last three minutes. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, it's it's uh, wonderful to hear from you and in these very challenging circumstances. You know, we did have a uh, tantalizingly uh, good situation just a few months ago with a tight labor market, and uh, we were hearing as what some of you said today, which is that uh, – opportunities were coming to low and moderate income communities that, that hadn't been seen in a long, long time. And so this is a hard, hard blow. It, it, um, there's no question about it. Uh, but I would say as a group, you guys are all about hope. You know, you're, you're about lighting a candle, although I, I'd say we're also cursing the darkness a little bit and appropriately so here. Um, so, you know, looking forward, uh, I do think it's important to, to, to and it, we say this to ourselves too, We've got to keep it in context. You know, the economy will recover. It will take time. But the main thing is we've got to get on. Fairly soon, we're going to be on the road to recovery and making progress and moving back toward where we were. We're going to get there. I, it may actually not take as long as it feels like it will take now. Uh, and um, I think, uh, you know, all of us need to work together, as, as, as uh uh, I guess Bobby said, you know, we've we got to help each other through this. Somebody said that. We've got to help each other through this, and that's what we're going to do. So you'll always have our support. We really appreciate the engagement with you, and thank you so much for being here today.